So um, I titled my uh, talk, Keep Toss or Repurpose, because over the past year, I've become a bit addicted to home organization shows. Not that my house is organized, but I like watching other people's houses get organized. And it did seem to fit with um, what we're all doing, which is trying to figure out going forward from here, what we're going to do with um, all of the new forms of teaching, the new technologies and so on that we have uh, been forced to get used to in a very uh, short period of time. Um, and um, Tom talked a little bit about what my portfolio is in the vice provost's office. Um, but I also consider particularly the vice provost innovations in undergraduate education portfolio to require a certain amount of crystal ball gazing, which means that that portfolio, rather than dealing necessarily with what's needed at the university tomorrow, um, really deals with where do we want to be five years from now? And so what we're doing in that office today is predicated on what we think we're going to need um, as a university five years from now. Um, so I, I spend a bit of my time trying to anticipate what the trends are in higher education. And of course, uh, this year has thrown, um, in some sense, a uh, tossed a Molotov cocktail into the whole thing, but it in some ways has simply accelerated some of the trends we already knew were coming. Um, and I'm going to start with a story about um, a conversation I had in 2019. Uh, I was talking to uh, a colleague who was very skeptical about online learning, uh, felt that online learning was simply inferior to in person in all ways, um, but also that online learning um, could be done at scale without regard to student experience, that you could have 50 people in your online class or you could have 150 or 1500 and you just could keep adding and and that scalability and lack of sort of personal connection was going to make online learning really problematic. First of all, I don't think that having 50 people in an online class is the same as 1500. I think there are substantial differences. I think online learning can be uh, quite a, a good form of teaching uh, if done well, um, and we are still learning how to do that uh, optimally. But the point that really landed for this person, and I think is a point that <clears throat> is critical is, and this was in 2019, I said, you know, in the future, distant, distant future, online learning is going to be a key and critical skill for our students to have. That to be successful, they're going to have to know how to learn online. And I really did not know at the time that that far distant future was six months away. Uh, and that we were on the cusp of a period of time where online learning which was already accelerating, was simply going to uh, speed up to like, like speed. So today I'm gonna talk about what I call the pandemic hysteresis. Um, and hysteresis, as you may know is, in engineering, uh, is a term that we use when we have systems where once you make a change and then you make the change back again, you land in a different place. Um, and this is particularly the case in things like material science and so forth. If you make a change to a state or a system that's an irreversible system and then you dial that back again, you don't land in the same place. Uh, and the sort of technical definition is the state of the system depends on its history. That's not true for all systems in engineering, but there are uh, quite a lot of systems that are irreversible that way. And certainly human systems are, are have that, um, that uh, uh, attribute. That when you make a change to the system and you change it back, 
it doesn't go back to where it was. Uh, there is a hysteresis associated with it. And human systems in particular are the product of their history. Um, and so we are going to emerge with a different steady state. And of course, no human system is really ever in steady state. We're always, um, it's always going to be changing. But we will be back to a different place um, when all of this um, kind of resolves uh, in the way that it's going to resolve whatever that looks like. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about three main trends that I see on the horizon. And I think for most of you, these will resonate as things that you're already aware of happening. Um, but I think that these are three uh, things where the acceleration, um, it's really been put into high speed by the pandemic. And that's blending micro credentials and learning analytics. So what do these things look like? Well, <clears throat> the 2020 style of blending looked a lot like a, a 50 car, car pileup on, on a highway, right? Uh, we were blending life, work, school, online, offline, trying to figure out just like how to go to the supermarket and shop for food <laughs> in a different way uh, than we have done before. Um, and so <clears throat> I think the blending that we have been doing has slowly gotten smoother, but really it was a mashup in a way that uh, was not necessarily as intentional or designed as we um, might have liked. And certainly in many ways was out of our control as public health measures changed and we had to respond. Uh, we were out of we were no longer in the driver's seat of the changes that were happening um, and no longer able to necessarily have control over the design of things. What I think will emerge out of this is a different kind of blending. And I hope it looks a lot, lot more like the picture on the right, which is a lot more, you know, attractive, uh, where we start to make some intentional decisions about how this blend is going to work. Um, and our students are going to make intentional decisions about how this blend is going to work, how they would want to balance uh, life and school. Um, perhaps it will be more intentional, perhaps it will look um, different. Um, I actually think that there's going to be a lot of decision making in 2021 around the life, work, school, online, offline um, balance. So when we think about this concept of blending and the degree of online learning this fall um, is going to gradually ebb, we're going to gradually roll back the amount of online learning we're doing and have more in person, we're not, that hysteresis is going to come into play. We're not going to roll back to where we were before. I don't know of a single course <clears throat> that hasn't been severely impacted in one way or another and that impact that history is going to play a role in how those courses are going to be redesigned because we've redesigned them once we're going to continue to redesign and much of this will come back to what we decide to keep what we decide to toss and what we're going to repurpose you know those videos that we've developed etc but more than that there's going to be a reinvention of work, life, and school blending. We're going to see much more integration between those things. People like some of the aspects of working from home. Our students like some of the aspects of learning from wherever they are or being able to learn where they are or where they want to be. And so some aspects of that blending are going to get consumed into the way in which we design courses and learning experiences, the way our students choose to engage with those learning experiences. There's going to be a lot of intentional or more intentional, I hope, decision making about keeping tossing and repurposing. And one of the um, uh, uh, pieces of information that informs me on this is what's happened at some universities that have experienced severe disruption in the past. If you look at 
Tulane University after Hurricane Katrina. If you look at Virginia Tech University after they had a very bad mass shooting situation, you saw faculty making um, a lot of different decisions about career paths, tenured stream faculty who decided I'd rather be in the teaching stream or uh, students who decided I want to pursue a different major. I want to do something different with my life after this ex experience. And that kind of intentional decision making was nearly impossible in 2020 when we were all just trying to sort of keep our noses above water. But in 2021, I think we're going to see more of that rethinking about the ways in which people blend their life. <clears throat> Another piece of this blending and hybrid learning that's going to come into play is that all of our students have successfully navigated online learning at this point. Whether they're coming out of high school and new to U of T, um, probably their high school was online or part of it was. All of our students that are progressing from you know, second year into third year have successfully navigated online learning to make that progress. So we have students who now successfully, at least successfully enough, know how to learn online. And their expectations of appropriate adept use of technology have gone up. Their expectations of intentional decisions about in-class and out-of-class time um, and what they are coming down to campus for have changed. Um, I think largely they um, are telling us that they miss coming onto campus for the sense of community and the sense of social interaction. How do we make sure that that's part of the design of our programs? Um, and they have fears about too much screen time, too little contact with people, and too many hours of instruction. Uh, and those are some of the things that we're, we heard in our first year design class, but we're hearing over and over in other venues as well. Um, and I liked this quote from one of our engineering students who said, the course affect influences the subject. The course affect influences the subject. And what this person meant by that was they've taken classes this year where they never saw their instructor. The instructor was a disembodied voice over the lecture. Um, they never had that sort of sense of personal interaction uh, and that influenced their perception of the subject they were learning um, and had a profound effect on their relationship, their emotional relationship to the subject matter. Um, and we know from, you know, Fink and others that if a student um, or anybody doesn't have an emotional connection or caring about what they're learning, retention is an issue. So I think we want to be thinking about how do we build in that affect. And in a classroom where they're sitting with their friends or sitting with a team, um, there is already a built in community affect to that classroom. Um, but that's not necessarily true with online courses. Um, and uh, we have the opportunity to, to think or rethink about uh, that affect. So let me move on to the second um, major trend that I think uh, is being accelerated. And that's micro-credentials or micro-certifications. Can you imagine taking two years off from work to move to a campus and learn what you need to know for your next job? Now, many of you are faculty and you probably are in one of the few remaining jobs in the world where you stay in that job for much of your life. Um, the reality is that most people change jobs a lot more than that. And in fact, in North America, the average person is now changing their job about 10 to 12 times during their adult life. And that doesn't just mean changing from 
one job to the same kind of job at a different company, it means really changing your job um, to something quite different potentially, or, or being flexible so that you can move into an emerging area or leaving, leave one where the jobs are drying up. And so this flux in um, job mobility is putting, uh, I think, putting us in a situation where all of us need to have a continuing education plan throughout our lives. And even if you were in the same job, that same job isn't going to look the same 10 years on because of the changes within the field. <clears throat> and so many institutions and governments are getting quite interested in micro-credentials, also referred to as micro-certifications. What do these things look like? You know, at U of T, we have minors. Um, within engineering, we have minors. There's bridging programs that uh, work with students who are sort of in third and fourth year to attain other kinds of job skills on their way out the door. There's continuing ed, um, which uh, people refer return to uh, throughout. There's certificates, there's diplomas. There are obviously online learning opportunities through MOOCs. Um, and so on. Um, you know, during my time uh, on, I I'm on leave this term, I'm using it to uh, revisit my statistics knowledge, and I'm doing that through a combination of online resources and other things. Um, Ontario is also getting quite interested in this, and they define um, micro-credentials as rapid training programs offered by universities, colleges, and indigenous institutes that are going to help people be employable. And obviously the Ontario government uh, is um, very interested in employability. And they are putting right now a load of resources into micro-credentials. They're making them OSAP, some of them OSAP eligible and so on. Um, and so, the government sees this as a key to keeping Ontarians uh, employable and up to speed, upskilling particularly, or reskilling. From the Ontario government's perspective, um, a micro-credential is something that takes less time than a degree or diploma. It's like 50, 40 to 50 hours in duration typically. It could be online, um, many are. Um, and they particularly like ones that are created with business sector input um, so that uh, to close what they refer to as the skills gap. And <clears throat> this particular government, I don't think it's any surprise, is particularly interested in the online aspect of these. And there's a lot to say about the positive aspects of online learning for micro-credentials because it is unlikely that you're going to leave a full-time job for two years to come back to an institution to travel to a campus in order to uh, upskill or reskill. Um, and so online learning has a lot of potential. And so they specifically are very interested in that. But at U of T, there's this, um, we actually think that there's a broader umbrella of programming, both in-person and online and blended and hybrid that uh, would fill this uh, gap. And we already have a lot of this going on. This is not new. But as I said, I think this hysteresis is going to throw, uh, you know, put the, the pedal down to the metal on, um, on areas around micro-credentialing. When we think about the students we have and who is engaging in micro-credentials, um, it isn't necessarily people like you and me. Um, it isn't necessarily people who are tenured or teaching stream faculty or, or who are on that track. We have a lot of different other kinds of students in our undergraduate uh, programs. And Greg Evans um, and his group with Chin uh, Liu and others have been doing um, an analytics project, a data analytics project on the personas of senior U of T engineering students. 
And their preliminary data suggests that you can kind of cluster our undergraduate engineering students into five groups. The highly engaged learners and perhaps even the moderately engaged learners are likely to be the ones who would pursue the kind of career path that perhaps you had, where you're going through undergraduate, and maybe on to some graduate um, training, uh, and perhaps into a job where on the job training kind of comes with the territory, right? Like I learn all the time because I am in an institution of learning. It is, it is written into the ethos of the place. But we have three or four other categories here, um, the co-curricular active learners, the work laden learners who have <clears throat> a large amount of uh, external work that they are doing. Typically paid job, but it could also be family care issues and so on. Um, those students and perhaps our least engaged learners, which is also a, a category that will successfully graduate in large part, are not necessarily going to be moving through a PhD. They may have different kinds of learning needs um, and are equally adept at learning. Uh, they've made it through U of T, but perhaps are not interested in the kind of career path uh, that takes them through traditional degree programs. They're seeking a different kind of lifelong learning. So this traditional, you know, four years on campus program, then you graduate, then you do a master's, then you graduate, that box is being blown apart. And it was being blown apart before the pandemic. But the pandemic has really, again, amped this up. And so the future of higher education, many people think, not just me and my crystal ball, but uh, many people believe, is going to look much more like a lifelong learning plan. It may start with two or three years on campus uh, out of high school, but then you may have a PEY year. And during that PEY, perhaps there's some embedded curriculum. Perhaps you're taking a course or two while you're on PEY. Maybe it pertains to your internship. It may even be a course that's taught by the company where you're working. And so that curriculum is a partnership between the company where you're working and the institution or the community organization where you're working or a consortium of community organizations gets together, works with the university to create a curriculum for their interns. And that gets delivered typically either uh, off hours, like you come down to campus for an intensive weekend or online. You might have a year abroad one of the real obstacles to a year abroad is trying to get courses at that visiting inst that institution you're visiting to match to courses at U of T, right? So we can do the transfer credits. Well, suppose we can only find two or three courses that match. Maybe you take the other two or three courses online at U of T during that semester abroad so that you're getting your full credits but you're also getting that embedded experience of taking courses in another institution in another country. Um, there may be self-paced courses, certificate programs, hybrid micromasters. Hybrid micromasters are things where uh, you might be doing part of the master's degree online, and then you may be coming onto campus for part of the master's degree. Maybe it's a, a condensed month or two where you're on campus, and then the rest of that year, you're off campus completing the rest of your program. We already have some programs like this. In nursing, we have programs that are essentially online uh, almost entirely. And part of that is because pulling a nurse out of a northern community to come onto campus for a year or two to do a master's just is not feasible. That would be their health, their only healthcare worker that is is uh, you know taking a sabbatical for a year or two. So um, those kinds of programs, I think, are going to become a mainstay of continuing education for many many of our students. Um, and we will still have important milestones like graduation. Uh, 
built in here and little other kinds of celebrations of completion, but it isn't going to look the same as that sort of lock step that um, we, I think we have in our minds that that's the way it works. It actually, for a very long time, most of our students have not been graduating um, in four years, uh, either because of a PUI or internship or co-op or uh, because they are going part time, um, the number of part time students is growing. It's it, the it's a bit of a fiction uh, of the the sort of the traditional um, experience. So, what do we need to do um, to repurpose what we're doing for this kind of future? Uh, what does that look like? Um, it may look like our courses get offered at different times during the year. It may look like uh, we have a more flexible way of um, designing things for students. How would we redesign courses, programs, and systems if this cloud is the norm? Because that traditional box is no longer the norm, but many of our systems courses and curriculum are designed as if that box is a reality. Uh, and that box isn't the reality anymore. And it, it won't be coming back. <laughs> so if we take a different perspective on lifelong learning, and instead of looking at the four year degree is kind of the anchor and then everything else is a spoke um, or wheel hub and the spokes, suppose instead we say that that degree program is one part of this integrated cloud of learning that our students are doing throughout their careers. Um, so what does that look like if the, the four-year degree becomes actually just another part of this integrated cloud? Um, because we do have more students going off on PUI or year abroad. We have more part-time students. We have more students who are completing a minor after they graduate. Um, and that end point is perhaps more of a, uh, a milestone and less of a stopping point uh, than it has been ever before. So that four-year program could become uh, partly online, integrated with work, because all we have students who are work-laden. You know, if we acknowledge that, then we may redesign a program around that. Uh, that blending of working and learning, the blending of on-campus, off-campus, coming back to that first theme of blending, all of that is being accelerated. Uh, and I think increasingly students are going to choose, um, having experienced the differences between on-campus and off-campus and so on, are going to start to choose ways in which they want that blend to occur. And the third trend that I'm going to talk about today, and then I'll open it up for questions and discussion, is um, learning analytics. So a big thank you to Lori Harrison, Avi Hyman, and Kieran Honda, and everybody, and it was a large ensemble cast who worked on the learning strategies uh, development for um, learning analytics strategies development for University of Toronto this past year, while and at the same time dealing with the pandemic. Um, and in that uh, report that um, we are uh, working out, um, learning analytics is the measurement and collection of ana and, and, and analysis and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for the purpose of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. And I think probably everybody who is on in this conference has had some interaction with learning analytics, um, even if it's just a histogram of grades <laughs> in, that you have in your course, that's learning analytics. You know, how many of your students did really poorly on question number two on the exam? And, and how did they do on four, question four? And what's the, you know, why did they do better on one than the other? Um, all of us deal with that kind of data and, and reflect on it in order to uh, think about how we are uh, working through our classes. But there are systems 
um, and platforms coming that are going to make that kind of analysis and reflection deeper and more endemic in our courses and in our systems and our curriculum. So part of the work that um, this group did was to do an environmental scan of other universities to see what's going on with learning analytics. And they identified something like 37 or 38 different projects at uh, leading universities, primarily in North America, uh, around learning analytics. Um, and these uh, included personalized feedback to students, advising and student success, dashboards for instructors, uh, you know, who's doing what um, and who is the audience for this type of da data aggregation. Uh, and uh, found a lot of very interesting examples of, of what's going on in this, um, in this field. And to give you a sense of some of these, um, for the University of Wisconsin uh, is doing some very interesting things with visualization of course level data around su student um, presence, behavior and performance, and then creating those visualizations kind of in front of the instructor. So the instructor doesn't necessarily need to go and do anything special or have to set that up themselves, it is presented to them. Um, and so they have a, a sense of where students are engaging with their course and when you have individual students who might be kind of falling off the radar. This is, of course, supported by the fact that much of the students interaction with courses outside of uh, class takes place online and therefore generates data exhaust uh, that can be analyzed for these purposes. At the University of British Columbia, they have a program called or a platform called um, Threads, which is a social network analysis tool that analyzes discussion boards um, and visualizes the data for instructors. Uh, and actually, we have something um, or in my class, we use something similar around the textbook that we're using um, and the readings. The system that we're using automatically generates a confusion report. So if students are annotating the textbook and identifying areas within the text where they're having difficulty, that confusion report um, locates that for us and identifies where we may be, um, where students may be getting confused around concepts. Um, and then uh, at U of T, we have the D3QA project um, where we have a group of uh, instructors here supported by our online learning office that are looking at how to use um, built-in Quirkus analytics to redesign or design their courses um, by using the data or data-informed design. Uh, and those uh, have been operating now for a year or two um, and some very interesting uh, findings uh, from that, uh, that group of what we can do with Quirkus as we have it right now, which is our learning management system for those of you not from U of T, um, and what things may be missing, where there are gaps, um, where we may need to either pur purchase or build uh, additional uh, systems to um, in order to be able to provide instructors with the information that they need uh, in real time. I think uh, some of the areas that I'm particularly interested in uh, related to learning analytics will be things like smart class lists, um, where your class list is not just the names of students in your class, but actually comes with information about how they did in prerequisites to your course, uh, perhaps what programs they are coming from, so you get a sense of the mix of students in your class, uh, and other kinds of information that just becomes part of the class list that you see. Um, part of course administration and student interaction is just um, uh, built around the data that is informing you about um, your students and the and 
how they are behaving both en masse and individually. And increasingly, um, these, these systems are being built in a way for, or built, being built for an audience that's not just the instructor, but for the student themselves. And so cutting across course silos, if we can bring together information for the student about how they are doing, about what kinds of classes they do well in, about what kinds of learning activities um, work effectively for them. Uh, it means that the student can make a better educated decision about uh, their future learning, about that pathway, that trajectory of lifelong learning. Um, and they can uh, sort of help coach themselves rather than uh, doing it only through advising systems. There's a number of other big trends um, that are out there that are kind of interesting on the horizon that we're keeping a bit of an eye on. And one of them is what happens when every school is an online, has online capability? What is that going to look like in the future? So there were a number of big players in the online space before all of this. ASU, SNHU, which is the Southern New Hampshire University, very large. Southern New Hampshire has maybe two or 3,000 students on campus. They have hundreds of thousands of students online. Very successful as an online institution. But we now have schools like Princeton and Stanford and U of T that have gone from a relatively small number of online courses. I think we had maybe 100, 150 online courses before the pandemic. And by last spring, we had 6,000 online courses, right? Um, what do we do with that? Um, there's tremendous potential there, but you don't want to simply say, let's do everything. You want to pick and choose. There is a lot of potential here. If you have a student who's trying to decide, for example, do I take that um, political science course that I'm interested in from ASU, or would I prefer to take it at Princeton? Eh, likely, if it's the same cost, they're going to pick Princeton. Um, for taking that class if they have the opportunity, if they can get into the class. So what do we do with this? Where do we go as an institution with uh, this capability? I think that will be um, a question we'll have. And if I think a little bit farther and sort of gaze further out into a crystal ball, and really this is totally speculative, my sense is that students are going to increasingly want to tailor their programs to their aspirations. And that aspiration may be programming that is different than the curriculum we have set up for them. They're already doing this with minors. They're already tailoring their, their programs. But I think increasingly they're going to want that kind of blend of work, school, and life to be more seamless. Um, they may we may need to look at major changes to the way we do scheduling. I know Steve Bailey and Julia have a, um, a fireside chat and a talk coming up on this, on the transforming the instructional landscape. And scheduling, smart scheduling is a key piece of this. If you have courses that don't have the sort of traditional, it's a lecture, it's a practical, or it's a, it's a, a tutorial, and those are your kind of your categories, how do we make this um, work together? And if the scheduling is doesn't look quite like the traditional kind of block scheduling that we're used to. Also, going into classrooms, it's not just how many seats there are in the room, but what kind of technology is in the room and how that works. Some schools are going to embrace this kind of diversity and flexibility, flexible learning. Um, and are going to move forward on it, I would imagine quite quickly because they will see it as a strategic advantage to do so. Um, other schools will take some time to get there, but I think it will become a, a key differentiator uh, for, for institutions. Learning analytics is going to become endemic, and teaching teams are already interprofessional. 
when you taught this year, if you were teaching a course this year, you weren't doing it by yourself. Likely you had an instructional technologist who was helping you out or there for to support you. You had your TAs, you had a variety of different people involved with your course. You might in the future have a learning strategist, especially if you're teaching a large course where students have a struggle. Um, and so we're going to see these kinds of interprofessional teams teaching in courses in a different way than we have before, I think. And I'll just end by saying that uh, with a couple of um, uh, sort of final thoughts that didn't neatly fit into any of the themes that I've talked about. The first one is, if we are doing more hybrid learning, if we are going to keep and not toss <laughs> or repurpose, some of those online lectures that we've developed or some of that other material, where are our students going to engage with that? Most of our computer labs are either computer labs for doing like programming courses kinds of things or they're in libraries because the students going there to do information searching. But this is different. This is like learning in a different way. Does it look like a hoteling space? How do we set this up? And finally, one big lesson learned, don't try and do everything in your class. The bells, the whistles, the multiple cool platforms is, is uh, really tricky for our students to navigate. So the more we can try and build in seamless, integrated consistency, the better the experience, at least in the online space, is going to be. And the affect matters of your course. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Susan. We do have time for questions, I believe. Um, and we do have one hand up. I think we have a couple hands up. OK, do you want to handle the hands, uh, Allison? Yes. I'm waiting for it to load. We're really pushing teams this morning. Um, <laughs> First up, we have uh, Steve Triber, and then we have Philip Isser. So um, Steve, was, Steve was first. Thank you, Allison. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Susan, thank you very much. Um, I'm a sessional lecturer. Um, I actually got my master's degree at U of T, and unfortunately, my PhD at McGill. <laughs> but So let me. <laughs> um, I'm a sessional lecturer of graduate engineering students. Uh, and uh, like so many of us, I've gone through a tremendous transition in all of my teaching. And I want to tell you that I will never go back to the way I did it before, ever. Even when I am in person with the students who choose to attend in person, I will also be online, mm -hmm. no matter what, forever, as long as I continue teaching. The one thing I have found there is that we've had to dis I've discovered all sorts of new ways of doing things. And Allison and her team have been helping me figure out how to actually make it work. And I've run into a number of problems with the software we have available to us. And I know you've heard about it. <laughs> Our processes for selecting new software are too antiquated to be able to adapt. You know this is what I'm saying. How are you going to be able to make the systems adapt so we could, uh, when we find, for example, that Snagit just isn't a good editor, and there's a good one from the same company called Camtasia. I yep. went and bought my own, right? Because yep. I wasn't going to wait. Um, but we need to do something, and our students are str so the things that I run into are then immediately felt by our students, for example, who won't spend the money to buy themselves a decent video camera. Right. Okay, because they don't have it, or they have other things that are more important. We need to address these things. Yeah, so so a couple of things about that. I mean, when, when the pandemic started, we immediately set up an emergency fund for students to purchase technology, and we have put out a, a 
quite, I can't remember what the number is right now, but a sizable amount of money has gone for emergency purchases for students on technology because we knew, knew that that was going to be critical for our students. Um, the technology in engineering, in, in uh, educational technology, instructional technology, and Avi Hyman could certainly talk more about this. I would encourage you to have, uh, go to his fireside or sandbox talk uh, or chat because um, he uh, is the person who works on the procurement process and the okay. um, selection process and has an, has an advisory group specifically set up to look at new technologies and to consider which ones we uh, purchase um, for the university or license for the university and when we leave it to divisions to choose what to license and so on. I will say this about educational technology. You know, all of us are used to technology like Uber and Facebook and Google and the amount of money that goes into Uber in a single day uh, in terms of development is uh, like the whole uh, educational technology innovation budget for not for U of T, I mean for the whole sector mm -hmm. for yeah. a year, right? Yeah. Like I read once, uh, and this was a couple of years ago, that the amount of money going into educational technology innovation is like $55 million a year. $55 million, that's like <laughs> this for, you know, that's a fraction of the budget of like, or I think it was $55 million. Um, so, Basically, educational technology has is not um, because the market is just smaller than many other kinds of technology. It really does not move as fast or or as uh, have all of that sort of resources to um, to change as quickly. We did an environmental scan of our educational technology resources to identify what the best universities in uh, North America had available. You know, what does Stanford have available to their instructors? Mm -hmm. We are right up there. Uh, with those schools. We are comparable. But it's, it's amazing that that's true um, because you and I both know that this technology can feel extremely clunky. We've had problems with Blackboard Collaborate. We've had problems with, as you say, like Snagit versus, you know, uh, Camtasia. I use Camtasia for exactly that same reason. Um, so, Yes, and yes, and yes, <laughs> you know, all of the above. Uh, yes, we know that um, we are uh, fighting to find the best technology that's also secure and meets our privacy concerns and meets, you know, cybersecurity concerns can scale to our scale because there's a lot of technology that just won't handle U of T because, <laughs> because of our size. Yep. So all of that, yes, you're absolutely right. So we're doing something about it, is what you're saying. Yes, we yeah. are working. We are working Thank on you. it. But uh, talk to Avi. <laughs> Thank you. I will. I will. Next question. Is there another one? Hand up, Allison. It was uh, Philip was next. Philip. Sorry, I posted my chat and the my question to chat because I have background noise. So. Oh, okay. What is? Can Allison? Could you read it for me? Because I'm having trouble seeing the chat. Sure. Uh, oh, Philip messed with us and has four questions. Uh, oh. I like the cloud perspective going beyond the nobody type. I'm going to lose the chat. Um, <laughs> going beyond the four year box. I wonder a couple of things. How that looks cost wise from a learner's perspective. What changes about what changes about the way we as faculty learning facilitators facilitators and maybe generally the university operate, especially around promotion and reviews. And then the last component was what changes about the university's organization to support this diversity of learning pathways and how can we still some support um, some coherence in curricula? Yeah, coherence in curricula is really, really tricky when you start getting uh, people going here, there and everywhere and kind of designing their own adventure. Um, uh, but arts and science manages to do it very effectively <laughs> or mostly effectively because um, their students, of course, do that. Um, the cost question is an interesting one. Um, I think that there are 
movements of governments to make some of this readily available to their citizenry because they realize that there is a long-term payoff. So for example, for a while, the, the Ontario government was licensing uh, lynda.com, which is now LinkedIn Learning uh, for citizens in Ontario. Um, the Singapore universe, uh, government of Singapore makes um, uh, MOOC courses that cost uh, a bit, um, certain a certain number and type of MOOC courses uh, through certain vendors available to their citizens. There's a grant program essentially for all citizens of Singapore. Um, so I, I do think that there are some, uh, and as I mentioned recently, or mentioned Ontario has recently um, uh, grown OSAP um, or repurposed OSAP to some micro-credential programs. Um, and so I think governments recognize that there's some strategic value there. Um, and so we will see some aid programs coming into place in the area of micro-credentials. But you're absolutely right. I mean, in some ways, spreading out that cost has some value. And this is part of the reason that many of our students choose to go on PEY, partly because they recognize the value of the work experience, but also because the break in the in the tuition between third and fourth year and earning a good salary for that year helps tremendously with their financial situation. Um, and so I do think that um, we're going to, as a society, have to figure out, uh, does do people get like a lifelong learning budget <laughs> You know, instead of getting just OSAP and just for OSAP eligible stuff, do you get kind of a, a learning uh, grant uh, that has a maximum on it that you use during your lifetime? Um, uh, in terms of facilitating and designing these things and, and tenure and universities will work through that, like what what counts toward um, promotion and tenure and PTR uh, will, I think, uh, already includes not just your teaching, but the other kinds of service you do, the kinds of um, you know, faculty advising you do uh, for students and, and other kinds of um, uh, things that you contribute. Um, so that will evolve as this system evolves. There are some interesting models out there that institutions are using for micro-credentials. Um, instead of, for example, at Berkeley, instead of um, designing and offering some of these kind of micro-masters programs in-house, completely in-house, they are contracting it out to a company. So the company does all of the administration. They do the admissions, they do the registrarial services, they do the, um, you know, the, the, all of that stuff is done by the company. Berkeley provides the content. So they're the content provider, but the master's program is completely, or part, one type of master's in data science is completely run by this private company. You wouldn't know it when you sign up. It looks and feels like a Berkeley program. It is Berkeley content, it is Berkeley instructors, but it is completely, all of the administrative support system is outsourced. Um, and so different um, institutions are taking different routes to uh, to allow for flexibility that is difficult to manage or ex too expensive to manage within a traditional institution. That was all of the hand raises. Philip, was that the um, end of your question or you can write in I, chat? I there? saw, well, I saw Mary's hand up for a second. Oh, did it didn't pop up for a second. <laughs> okay, I'll ask a question. What is your issue? <laughs> I think Philip is not muted yet. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Back. I love your kids. <laughs> I've um, seen them several times. <laughs> Mary? Oh, yeah. So um, I guess I had two concerns about this future. One is it's not obvious where the humanities fit in unless the time away from being on campus is going to another campus abroad for a year and spending a year in a library somewhere else. And also a lot of these experiences that are being described are very high touch. Mm -hmm. And you need like one full-time staff member for every 30 undergraduates doing a community engaged learning thing. And uh, 
the Faculty of Arts and Science has 28,000 students mm -hmm. who are not paying the type of tuition that engineering students are paying. And I just sort of worry about a very, very utilitarian future. Yeah, I actually see it the other way <laughs> around, which is a much more humanitarian future. Um, and I think part of that is because, um, you know, a lot of, not all, and Greg Evans will correct me on this, not all of engineering is uh, just technical subjects, but a lot of our content is. A lot of our content is, you know, you're learning your fluid mechanics and your solid mechanics and, and things like this. Um, you, your where you might be learning how to uh, do things that are um, uh, based around humans is in those work terms and so forth. I think our work terms are going to get much more diverse. So it's not going to be the work term at Google um, or the work term at TD Bank um, I think we're going to see increasingly work terms at community organizations, nonprofits. Um, there's a, a sort of a, a three way win when a donor gives funding to a student to take an internship at a nonprofit. The nonprofit gets a highly qualified person, the uh, student gets paid uh, and gets uh, work experience. And so it's a three way win on um, that kind of a scholarship. It's not a scholarship to go to school, it's a scholarship to do an internship that's different than a industry internship. Um, and so I think there are more opportunities in humanities when we think about, um, it's not just going abroad to a different library at a different university, but maybe spending the year working with UNESCO or maybe spending the year working with uh, some other kind of organization. Um, we're seeing an expansion of, of co-op and PY type uh, programs into, um, for example, arts and science. Um, and I'd actually like to see us doing more in-house internships, not just work study, but Rotman, for example, has an in-house consulting company. Their students work in the consulting company and take on projects for external clients. Well, suppose we had a consulting company being run out of political science or being run out of um, psychology, uh, what would that look like? And what opportunities might that provide for students to blend work with um, school? Um, and so uh, you're right, some of these are high touch and we're gonna have to figure out how to uh, enable um, uh, some of this to work. Uh, but I think that this is what institutions around the world and primarily in North America, are really considering. Um, we are Thank coming you. up on, sorry, Mary, um, we're coming up on time. So one of the nice things about the virtual day is that you can just leave. I won't even notice. Um, <laughs> before we, we wrap up, I'm going to actually pull one last question from the chat. Slight amount of housekeeping. Uh, I forgot to mention in the earlier preamble that volunteers in GatherTan will have volunteer after their name. So if you see somebody with that, ask them questions, they're there to help. There are new co-op students for the summer, so they'll be happy to direct your question. And then just a reminder that um, Susan will be in GatherTan from 11.30 to 12 for a little bit more follow-up. And um, the last question though, maybe for you, Susan, um, was from Alan and he says, suspects that you're preaching mostly to the choir on this call. Um, how do you bring those who might be a little bit more reluctant to this change? Um, how do you bring them along for the ride? Yeah, and you know, I, I, I mean, my, my crystal ball isn't really that crystally <laughs> in that I'm just telling, I, I mean, I think I am telling people what is already happening. It's, you know, the future is now. <laughs> like this isn't the future of, and this goes back to that story that I told at the beginning about, you know, every, in the future, everybody's gonna be learning online or everybody's gonna have some learning online and needs to know how to learn online. The future is today. Today, most of our students do not graduate in four years. Today, most of our students engage in other types of learning 
while at the university and beyond. Today, our students are integrating work with the university. We just haven't really dealt with that in a way that intentionally designs programs to take that into a, that reality into account fully. Um, and so we have, this is part of the data Pro, um, systems, the learning analytics, the data analytics that we're working through these dashboards to help sort of put that data in front of people and say, this is this is what's happening. So how do we take that into account? Um, so I, I, you're right. Um, I am in some ways preaching to the choir today, uh, but um, I think, you know, those messages to your average faculty member, they'd be like, you know, I kind of knew that. Like that that kind of looks like what my students look like. All right, I uh, would just like everyone to note that we started this conference exactly at 10 a.m. and we're ending the keynote session at exactly 11.15. <laughs> so I'm not sure if there's awards, but I think we won them. Um, so 15 minute break. Uh, Relax, take a, take a few moments. Session block one is coming. Thank you so much, um, Susan, for spending the morning with us and the next little bit as well. Um, this was recorded, so we'll be able to, to review it later. And we'll, we're aiming today to have all of the content that we record up on our website by, the, by early June. So um, you'll be able to take a look at anything that you uh, missed or we, we did start a little early, so maybe not a perfect scheduling award today. So. <laughs> Um, thank you again, Susan, and um, see everybody at the next session. Yeah, I'll see you in Gather Town. Bye bye.